Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are we all ready? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Um, our Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for gathering us here again at your feet to learn from you. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our midst. Amen. We pray that you will teach us. Amen. We pray that you open our hearts. Amen. I pray that it is your voice that we will hear this morning in the Amen. name of Jesus. Amen. Father, cleanse us and enable us to receive your instructions this morning. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so this morning we'll be treating lesson 45 for Treasures from Heaven. And the topic is the first Christians. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our lesson text is Acts 11, 19 to 26. Acts 11, 19 to 26. Can someone please read for us? Acts chapter 11, from verse 19 to 26. Okay. Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. When he found him, oh, okay, 27. Media, 27. Technica, 27. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch, 28. One of them, named Agabus, stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could, 30. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Thank you so much, sir. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. So for our memory verse, it's specifically Acts 11.26. Can you help us project it so that we can read it together? Acts 11.26. One, two, three, let's go. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was as Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Praise the Lord. So from our outline, we can see that God has commanded us as Christians to go into the world and preach the gospel. And he has provided us with the tools to enable us to do this preaching. Hallelujah. Okay, let me read the introduction. So Jesus Christ came into the world. He suffered and died for all. We see that in John 3, verse 16. After his resurrection, he commanded Christians to go into the world to preach the good news. And he gave them tools to make this job easy. We see that in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Can someone read that for us, please? Media? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Me 
Lydia. Technica. Anybody there? Yeah. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Okay, all I right. can. Okay. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 20. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, sir. So that scripture basically shows us the tools that God has given to us to preach this gospel. Can we identify some of the tools from that scripture? Some of the tools that God has given us. I can start, number one, our mouth. <laughs> That's the most obvious one. <laughs> our mouth is one of the tools that God has equipped us with to spread the gospel. The word of God. Authority. So that's the backing we have. It's not of our own doing. And but our it's legs. And our legs and also. Our legs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So God has given us tools from my study in here. I know I wrote, I said, our mouth teach all nations, baptizing them. So we have an activity to do. It's not just after teaching them when they have consumed the word, but to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We have to teach them to observe all that God has commanded us. Where do we find the commandments of God? In the word of God. So at the end, everything starts and ends with the word of God. So to be able to have effective evangelism, to bring many to Christ, you need to be loaded. You need to have knowledge and actually know the word of God. Praise the Lord. So, sorry, to continue the introduction, it says, the same instruction came at ascension. Paul was at the center of the persecution. We see that in Acts 18, 1 to 4. Remember, the topic for today is the first Christian. So, we're doing an introduction to begin our discussion. So, talking about Saul, can we read Acts 8, 1 to 4? Acts chapter 8. Verse 1 to 4. Okay, Acts 8, 1 to 4. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Praise the Lord. My version said that Paul wrecked havoc. <laughs> what does havoc mean? Great destruction. It was like a personal vendetta for him, yes. He took it personally. And sometimes I try to imagine what Paul would have been. I think he was a lawyer also. <laughs> but I'm trying to remember. I can imagine what he would have been like if he was here. Probably was a Hitler in terms of the aggression in which he went. He took it personal. He was going everywhere. He said he went house to house, men and women, dragging them out to prison. All of you, <laughs> you say you're what, a Christian? Let's go. He took it personally. That's the same energy, E for energy. That's the same energy that God expects from us as Christians. You know. But in all this persecution, in all this suffering, what can we see from the first church? The Bible says that they were not deterred. They went on. In the midst of all the persecution, they went on preaching. It says they were uprooted from their base and would have accommodation and other issues. They were, however, not deterred as they went about preaching the gospel. One of the results of their action is the essence of our study today. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we'll look at the text review, Acts chapter 11 from verse 19 to 30 that we read. 
It says persecution caused them to migrate to places. So they went to Cyprus, they went to Antioch. Can you imagine like those days, even now for me that left my daddy and my mommy and came to this America. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I, I talk to my father at least five times in a week. Sometimes he's my companion to the train. But imagine these people, you know, they probably lived in communities that were familiar to them. They probably knew who was next door, but then they saw this persecution going around just because you identify with Jesus and you're forced to leave your home. What can, what, can we just imagine the kind of challenges they had to face? If their kids were like in a school where they were teaching them about the laws of God, they had to change because everybody was running so that you don't get killed. They had to change environment. That would have really been stressful. Can we all agree on that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, people being displaced from their home. Yeah. But the Bible says that they continued as it was their nature before to preach. Can we share as to what, what made them continue in the face of all this tribulation, being displaced? You're no longer, you're used to living in New York, but now they say Christians can no longer pray in New York, but people are moving and still continuing what they were doing before. What made them continue? I think it must have been a deep conviction of what they had believed. Because let's, let's bring it to our, sometimes I like to bring Bible incidents to our time. Right? So, typically, somebody now persecutes Christians in Manhattan or in New York, and then you manage to escape to New Jersey. And the same reason why you were persecuted in New York, if you get to New Jersey and you want to start preaching Jesus, I believe there will be some around you who say, oh boy, have you forgotten what Chase does here? You want to start again? <laughs> Our generation will say, better be wise, prepare, protect your head. Oh. But these ones, they were so convinced that we were persecuted, we were displaced because of this, but we would rather die. I think that's the, the point they had gotten to. We cannot but preach this gospel wherever we find ourselves. It's a lesson to us. I think it's just for us to reflect. If we were in these people's shoes, the reason why some of us don't even talk about Jesus in our offices is because of fear. That one is not even that they will kill you. They didn't wreck havoc. It's just bread and butter. But this one is at the very peril of their lives. Yeah. But the same thing that endangered their life where they're coming from, when they got to this new place, they still continued because they were coming. God will help us, me and you. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes. Sobola said, that looking forward to that holy place where we are going to, that those mansions, those, um, you know, to, to, to the kingdom of God yeah. that we are going to, that is like, if you have a good, deep conviction about that, nothing will make you want to stop going there, to yeah. stop you from going there, rather. Yeah. So you have that thing in mind, in focus, that we are going to that uh, place of glory, yeah. and you want to be there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Any other contributions? Okay. So just to go through the lesson I outlined for the text review. It says here that they went about preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, like we said, the hand of God was with them, and a great number of them believed and turned to Jesus. So one of the great reasons why they turned to Jesus was because the hand of God was actually upon them. And I think that they had that consciousness. You know, when you have the consciousness that it's not just me that is going somewhere, it's, you're, it's like you're fortified more for the road ahead. It's like a child, you know, children will say, I would put my daddy to you. That's because they know that when their daddy comes, <laughs> their daddy is strong enough to, you know, to meet the opposition. I remember back then in school, you do me anything, I'll tell my mommy for you, simple and short. <laughs> but that's because I believed in my heart of heart that if my mother comes to that place, she's going to handle the situation. So that's the same thing I think they had. The hand of God was mighty upon them. So they knew that uh, it's not just us. You know, God is involved in what we are doing. Praise the Lord. He says, the news came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and Barnabas was sent to Antioch. Why do we think Barnabas was sent? Exactly. To encourage them. Yes, hallelujah. You know, sometimes if you're going through something, there is this, um, you feel better when somebody that probably has gone through it before, or someone that is higher than you, comes and gives you counsel, or gives you encouragement. It, there's something it does to your soul. It lifts you up. Hallelujah. 
So that's what I think Barnabas was there for. Barnabas saw the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to continue with the Lord. We see that in verse 23. Many people were added to the church because of the character of Barnabas. Can we project Acts 11:24, please? It says, many people were added to the church because of the character of Barnabas. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. In our time now, 2023, is it very obvious to see someone who is full of the Holy Ghost and with faith? Is this something we see a lot? Can we share, please? People turned to Christ because of a man's character, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Can we see faith with our eyes? Is it something we can see? The truth of the matter is that in every generation, the Holy Spirit is present. Now, whether we now acknowledge the Holy Spirit or we acknowledge those who carry the Holy Spirit is a different matter. Unfortunately, our generation, I, I hate to say we missed it at some point. We had a focus oftentimes is on the material and the dramatic. But I still tell you there are, like they told the, the prophet, there are still 450 prophets who have not bowed to buy. So for every aberration of Christianity that we see, it shouldn't be a discouragement. Because there are secret souls, there are secret Barnabases who are groaning for the nations and the Holy Spirit is with them. So I think it's really for us. I believe the people of that town, they identified and recognized good when they saw it. So it's really about what, when we come, what are we looking for? It's what you are looking for that you will find. God will help us. Amen. Any other contributions? Yes, sir. Um, like you said, Barnabas, people saw Barnabas and they were attracted to his kind of lifestyle and, of course, by that. So I think it does justify what the Bible says, that let our lives, our lights so shine mm -hmm. that men will see us and yes. they cry our Father in heaven. So when our lights are shining, when men see us, they will cry our Father in heaven and they will want to come to that knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. So like you said, our lives, just like Barnabas, has to shine. And of course, in this generation, it's, it depends on where we go. There are people too. You can't say because it's just of the old. Because probably now, we are more aware. Everybody, the world is like a global village. It's like one now. So we know everything that is happening. But I guess, I mean, in so many places as well, there are people that live for Christ and their lives are, 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 have been shining, you know, and people through them have been coming to the knowledge of Christ. So I would say in the, past, in the, in the old, they were more, no, I will say that. Also in this generation, there are people that their lives also. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ma. Has, does anyone have maybe a personal experience here of how maybe they changed their conviction or they got drawn to Christ because of another person? You know, we've shared that there are still people in our generation that carry this fire and this way, but does anyone have maybe any testimony? of how maybe they came to Christ or someone they know came to Christ because of another person? Anyone? <laughs> okay. Okay, yes, Sister Titi, thank you. Praise God, Caroline. Um, I just remembered um, when I was in school, university, I had a roommate. Um, Whose parents were actually pastors, but I mean, she came to school and sort of backslid. Um, and I remember we were, I think, four in a room then. And we knew that, you know, she was different. And she would always tell us, oh, my parents are pastors, but she was doing like a lot of things that, you know, shouldn't be done. And I remember we would just sort of show her love and not judge her. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when we were about to leave the hostel, I remember she was completely transformed and we were always wondering like what happened because it just got to like the middle of the semester and she would just join us to go to the fellowships and her dressing started to change and when we were about to leave like she was literally crying and saying oh you guys were not judgmental you guys were pulling me in love so I think 
I just remember that example. It, it's been years, but I, I think the fact that we didn't exactly know what happened because if your parents are pastors, obviously, like you grew up in the faith and all of that, but maybe something happened at some point, but we were not judgmental. We would like invite her, and if she says no, it's like, it's okay. Um, we'll take her out. We're, like, we, were, we didn't sort of segregate her and say, oh, you're different. We didn't make her feel like she was left out. So I think just showing love, and I think we also prayed for her sometimes. I would go to fellowships and just pray for her. But even up till now, like, we are still friends on Instagram. And I see she's posting scriptures. And I just remember, like, oh, like, just an encounter one semester with four people in your room. Sort of God made that transform her life. So I think that was, like, a personal experience. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> that story actually reminded me of another um, experience. In university, I had this friend, very wild, very, very wild. She was from River State, so <laughs> it was fun. Anything happening, latest Brazilian hair, latest ripped jean, she was on it. She was the happening babe, and she was my very good friend. And I remember when I would go for midweek service, I would come back. I would always stop in her room. Of course, she would gist me and hear what thing happen. We would shout out talk. <laughs> and then I would tell her, I say, ah, let me tell you what we learned in church. Say, ah, everybody used to call me by my son name. Who don't go, you don't come again. And I would tell her, I say, listen, this is what they preach today in church. And I would shout share with her and go. But did, when she gave her life to Christ, ah. It was, she was on the extreme side. <laughs> you know, God himself was the one that brought her. But the part of this story was that she, in her, you know, in talking about her faith, she used to say, I remember when Udongo would come back from midweek service. She'd always stop my room. They always tell me what the pastor to preach. You know, so that's, you, it might not necessarily be your life. It might be the actions you do. I was her friend, but I always made it the point of duty. When I'm coming by, I must stop by her room. I'm waiting with the eat. And as I'm there, I will share with her. Today, we studied about faith, believing God, trusting God. It's okay. I believe God. I trust God. Thank you. But those little seeds, she remembered it. You know, so it might be the little things we're planting in the hearts of people. Praise the Lord. And, and this, I say, because it relates to the uh, text. So you see, wh when, when the believers heard about the other people there, they didn't just go empty-handed. Mm. They didn't only really just bring the word of God. They, they collected Thanks. offerings and what those people would need mm -hmm. to show them love. Yes. So, so, so the point I'm just trying to bring that sometimes our words are hollow because they're not backed up with the love the people want to see. Like my wife would tell you how she came to Christ. My wife is from a staunch Muslim family. In fact, her grandfather was the chief imam of Ibadan, to show you how chronic they were. But the person who, like, your, like you were doing with your friend, that's what reminded me. This sister, will, my wife, invite my wife to a fellowship. She will give one excuse, give one excuse. So one day she gave excuse, I want to cook, I want to do. The person stayed, helped her do every, she, this what she, helped her do. So she got, she felt guilty. Ah. I've done everything. This person stayed here. Help me finish my cleaning. Help me finish my cooking. Just, I must take you to fellowship. And that sister will not know the seed. So my wife followed her that day. One thing led to another. She gave her life to Christ. And you know, Muslims, when they give their life to Christ, sometimes they are more chronic than those of us who were born in Christianity. Yes. And that's, so <laughs> they pray five times a day, everything. Just, she just used it now for Christ. Because one person would not take no for an answer. Every excuse, you want to clean, I will help you clean your room, don't worry. If this is what we delay you, I will help you do it. You want to copy notes, I will help you copy the notes so that we can go. So, how much are we willing to invest? Because my wife agreed to go out of, ah, this person has tried, do me fear. If after this person has helped me do all my cleaning, do all that, I will now go. And that was the meeting at which she gave her life to Christ. So, I just wanted to say this to say, Beyond our words, we need to back it with love and action that people can see is genuine. Mm. Thank you so much, Pastor. Okay, Father Femi. Um, I just wanted to like, add to what Pastor Bogadi said. Um, because looking at this verse, it starts with uh, Barnabas was a good man. I always hear people say how they are good. I'm a good person. I don't know why this is going on. But then after that, it says full of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the criteria of you being a good person. One and... Um, being full of the Holy Spirit is more like the basic minimum requirements of a Christian. Mm -hmm. 
if you if you could check look for I mean look yeah look for one again and look at the, the talk about Jesus he said Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit was driven into the wilderness so and he came back what in the power of the Holy Spirit so the context here is are we filled with the Holy Spirit because being filled with the Holy Spirit see what this guy was doing you know, uh, Barnabas. Uh, so it, it, it's the question we need to ask ourselves when we talk about whether we are good or not. Mm -hmm. um, what, how, are, how is that playing out in our lives? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Barfa. But just to piggyback on what you've just shared, and this side of the room has been very quiet, so let's try and contribute also. So you said, you know, he was a good man and he was full of the Holy Ghost, which is a criteria for being a good person. If you bring it back to our generation, like this time now, there are a lot of people I probably have met, and I'm sure maybe some of us have also met, in Christian fellowships back then in school, who were full of the Holy Ghost at a moment. They can speak in tongues from now till evening. But at a later hour of the evening, when you sit there, you'll be like, ah, is this a good man? Because of the kind of places they are, the kind of things they are doing. So, the, the feeling, be filled, uh, that, that, was, that was what I was going to say. Okay. Be filled with Holy Spirit has nothing to do with speaking in tongues. Okay. I, can, I can perform from now to next week. I have prayed for 12 hours, okay. but I'm deceiving myself. Okay. It, does, it has nothing to do with that. Okay. Absolutely nothing. And I think it's good we, we arrived at that point. Yes. I, I think our our generation of Christians, we, we have these uh, stereotypes we tick. Mm. And so long as that outward, you understand, you know, <laughs> just like how you know how you go to your office and you blend in. Mm. Anybody can come into church and blend in. Yeah. Because we have reduced Christianity to schisms and mannerisms, right? Mm. All I need to do is every time, I bless you, it is well, it is well. You speak churches. <laughs> everybody knows the language of the church is so it, is it everybody that comes and is bless you it is well that is well mm -hmm. right speaking in tongues now there are places where they teach people to speak in tongues it's yes. not that the Holy Spirit came into them so let's stop fooling ourselves that's why the Bible says in this time we need more than anything else the spirit of discernment yes. and it's only the Holy Spirit indwelling in you that can actually help you discern spirits so let's not get carried away that somebody speaking in tongues does not mean they are holy. Okay. That somebody can read Bible from Genesis to head from their head, lawyers cram <laughs> case law. Anybody can cram the Bible and dazzle you with scriptures. That's why the Bible says by their fruits we shall know them. Yes. So you can do all the miracles on earth. It can be by the power of the devil in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Mm. So I'm not moved by that. It's your fruits that will demonstrate who is filled with the Holy Spirit, not the works. I'm sorry. Works is good, but not the works. Don't get carried away by the razzmatazz. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for sharing. Hallelujah. By the fruits that they produce, we shall know them. Hallelujah. This side of the room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so we're going to start with le lesson outline A, which is titled The Birth. It says here that the church was birthed by laymen through their preaching and witnessing. So it's not like these men were, they had gone to the school of theology or they were, you know. Yes. <laughs> I said the class rep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's not like they had been through some sort of training. They were laymen. But I feel like what set them apart was the hunger. Yes, and the Holy Spirit. So they were not, you know, skilled men or some sort of, you know, special men. They were regular, normal people like you and I. Praise the Lord. It says the gospel was for everyone. But God had to persuade Peter to preach to Cornelius. Why? Can, can we read um, Acts 10? Let me get the specific scripture, please. Acts 10, 28, please. Acts chapter 10, verse 28. It says, Peter told them, you know, it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a gentle home like this or to associate with you but God has shown me 
that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Praise the Lord. Why did God have to, you know, go to Peter and show him that? Jewish tradition, you know, okay. they had that mind of, you know, and you still have it now, the kosher writ, um, written, they are, most of their things are set out to be pure, their standards, they, they put out for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just, I think this was a situation where God was letting him know that it was time to get to the to nations, the mm -hmm. Gentiles, mm -hmm. and um, he wanted to take him through this route to make him understand um, that it was, it was going beyond um, what he had set out but, I mean, beyond what Jesus has done, he was going to be going further. Jesus dealt with the Jews, but they were to go further into the world. Okay. Praise the Lord. I think to also bring it further to our time now, there probably are people that we know of our, in our hearts of hearts that we should be speaking to about Jesus. We know, we work with these people at work. They are our neighbors. Their children are our children's friends. In our farm, exactly. <laughs> our sisters, the one we call to gist every weekend. But we know in our heart of heart that these people probably should be telling them more about Jesus. But we haven't done it. Why? Could it be that we're waiting for God the same way he came to Peter? <laughs> mm. Okay. The compassion because everything that Christ did was driven by compassion uh, and it's a challenge to all of us if I love my siblings if I love my friends mm. as I claim to do will I see them in a situation that will take them to death and I will not caution so we really need to question our compassion towards people because if I love you well enough I have compassion for you well enough and I see you doing something that will kill you I will not keep quiet. So it's really about us questioning our compassion. If we say we really love our family members, if we love our friends, that compassion should compel us to tell them that they are drinking poison. Okay. Where is the sister up there? Okay. Ah, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I think that, um, so your friends, the people you interact with every day that are not necessarily saved, because they are not committing sin that is so grandiose, like they're not killing anybody, they're not going to rob a bank, they're just living their lives just like you would. You are not consciously thinking of them going to hell. That's not what's on your mind. And I think that's one of the things, the, the plots of the enemy. So it's just very subtle. I can't imagine me talking to like my close friend from like high school that we've been Jesus seen together in quotes. She believes in God, but she's not necessarily saved. I can't imagine me now coming to tell her, oh, you need to give your life to Christ. It will just be so awkward, right? Like even if you see families where pa their dads are pastors, most of those children, it's not really the dad that led them to Christ. It's like other people. So I think as much as, you know, we should have compassion on our friends and all of that, I think for we ourselves, we need to be more heaven conscious because if we are more heaven conscious, we are seeing that person heading to hell then that's what will lead to the compassion. So I think it starts with us being more like heaven conscious as opposed to me wanting to condemn, you know, my friend who doesn't appear to be heading towards heaven. Praise God. Praise God. Um, I think just to bring it home, um, my younger sister and I were contemplating how to talk about, you know, Christ, even to our siblings. So sometimes it's about the technique. Um, you, you sometimes think uh, when you're too brash and you're quoting Bible, it's not as practical. So you kind of have to kind of think about the context of the person you're trying to engage. In, your case, in my case, my sibling. And just looking at practical ways that I can bring the message home. So in that scenario where when I was talking about Christ to my sibling, I was just looking at his context and talking about specific Bible scenarios that fit, that fit his context. Uh, whether or not 
you know, um, the message was heard or, you know, whether I, I didn't bother myself about the, how it sort of materialized, but I looked at this context and I shared particular Bible references that kind of met that context uh, to, you know, just share the word of God and the essence and the rationale behind why I'm Christian and what are the benefits of what I'm getting from it. You know, and also just living out your life. The way you live out your life, too, is important because they can see how you demonstrate faith mm -hmm. in different ways mm -hmm. where if that's a limitation on their end, they can also realize that, ah, there's something here that I might want to even know and find out more by actually reaching out to this person. Or you can also be proactive and talk about it and share it. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for sharing. I think one of, another thing that I, I feel like probably is an issue for some people is they, they feel like you need to be perfect. You need to be a certain way to be able to preach or tell people about Jesus. Can we look at Galatians 2? Oh, sorry. Just also as Sister Odun, Pastor Odun was speaking, I remembered, um, you know, Jesus and the woman at the well. You know, when um, <laughs> he approached her and was asking for water, he kind of threw some shade at her, you know, and when he asked her, oh, um, how many, um, the, hus the person you are with is not your husband. He was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so he found an avenue to kind of relate with her at her position, said, yeah, I know the person you're with is not your husband. You, in fact, you've had several husbands. And then he was now able to offer her the living water. So just to like, contextualize what Sister Odun has said, sometimes familiarity is so hard to break when we're trying to share the gospel. But if we're able to find a way where we are, there's a similarity or familiarity or somewhere that is kind of like an obvious area that needs to be addressed and then break in through that area. Just with using how Jesus Christ addressed the woman at the well. Amen. Thank you so much, Ma, for sharing. Okay. Just in addition to what um, Pastor Tenny said, um, mm -hmm. you know, this same thing happened with Paul. Um, Ma Acts 17, 23. When he talked, he saw a statue of an unknown God and he used that context to draw the people's attention because the ancients at that point in time, they were all just interested in um, how I use, what they call this thing, um, philosophy. They were so, they, if you had like all the logic and reasoning to speak to them, that's what they wanted to listen to. So he was, that was what he used to drive them to, you know, to the gospel. So we also, I, I, but this also still leads to the context of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's very important for us to understand that thing. It's the Holy Spirit that will lead you. You can't do the work of God without him being there. You, would, you will suffer a lot, but may God give us understanding. Amen. So because of time, we're not going to read Acts anymore. But just to show that, you know, God does not need us to be in a perfect state to be able to use us to fulfill his, you know, to bring many to Christ. We can see Peter, for example, when Paul rebuked him in Galatians, what did Peter do? He was first with the Gentiles, but then when he saw his fellow Jew people coming, he's like, oh, I can't sit with these people. He was, being, he was being an hypocrite at that moment, and Paul had to rebuke him, like, what you're doing is, is wrong. But that same Peter, God used him all through the scriptures, after the Holy Spirit has come upon him. The many, many people came to Christ through Peter's example. So God can use any one of us. We don't need to be, because I think that's the major resistance sometimes is, ah, me like this, that my friends already know my way of life. I want to go and start telling them about Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like, you know, is this you? Or now nah, you be this, you know. Sometimes we look at ourselves, people already know our history. Would they listen to us if we come? But... That's not our work. Praise the Lord. Um, for I have a question, actually. So bringing it to today, what are some hindrances that we can say, like stop us from preaching the word of God? Brother Favor. <laughs> We've never heard your voice in this church. Oh never. <laughs> Why 
What are some hindrances that stop people today? What stops you as a brother? You're a Christian. What stops you from preaching to Sister Inem or even people you work with? You work with a lot of Arabs. What stops you from saying, Guy, how far Jesus loves you? What are some hindrances? Let's share, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> she really placed me on this spot. <laughs> So, yeah, there are a couple of reasons why people decide not to share their faith with other folks from, especially in the work setting. Um, one of the major reasons, I will use myself as a case study, is first, we have policies at our different workplaces. And one of the policy is religion is considered personal. As much as you want to voice your own um, beliefs, you have to do it in a way where you don't impose it on someone else. So um, that is part of the first reason, especially in this setting here in um, a professional work environment. But outside the work environment, some of the reasons why people would not go ahead and preach is one, um, we we sometimes misplace our priorities. Some people believe, um, I don't have the time to go to the streets. Why would I Why would I go to the street and start preaching to people on the street when I can use, spend this time doing something else, maybe writing a project mm -hmm. or doing my, my coursework or something else. So first, we have misplaced priorities as Christians. I remember when um, I was in Nigeria as a child, Usually we have uh, what we call a Bible club that we usually do every Saturday. And when, when it comes to that time, we go out as kids, we go to the street, we preach, we spend a lot of time doing that. But now as adults, we would feel like, I don't have the time to do that. I would rather spend that time doing something else, something different. So I think one of the major reasons is misplaced priorities. Okay. And then um, a second reason is especially as kids in the university, we're like, what will people think of me? What will people think of me? You don't look uh, cool I, anymore. I want, I want to look cool, mm. right? Uh, when we come back home, we are with our parents. We feel okay, yes, we can go out and preach because, I mean, everyone at home knows we're a Christian. But when you are now in the university where you're with your so-called cool friends, you want to mark that I'm a Christian. You don't want to share too much just want to sound very cool. Mm. So I feel like there are multiple other reasons, but I will let other people also share them. <laughs> I feel like you are looking at my notes. <laughs> Did you look at my notes? <laughs> because you've literally I, just I said everything. I tried not to look at it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Because of time, I think we won't take multiple control, but that's it. I think to sum everything up, fear is a very big reason. Fear of rejection, fear of being judged. We don't want to you know, go into it. But how can we overcome these hindrances just as a concluding factor for this section? Okay, so, let me just quickly say, okay. So, so the context of today's teaching, and that's uh, our anchor scripture, is about that they were first called Christians mm -hmm. in Antioch. Mm -hmm. It wasn't them that said we are Christians. Christians yes. It's other people that saw their lifestyle, saw their mannerisms, and concluded that these people must have been with Christ. Mm. So can people see me and you? And without us, because if you have to open your mouth to say I'm a Christian, then something is still wrong. Absolutely. People should be able to notice something different about you. They should be the ones inquiring from you. How are you like this? I saw that person upset you. You didn't get angry. Mm. I saw whenever we gather to gang up against people, you are not part of us. They are the ones who should get curious. They should be the ones asking you, why are you able to keep cool? Then that gives you an entry point to talk about your faith. Mm. See, it's not that I didn't get angry, but I can't do that because I'm a child of God. I can't do that because I'm a Christian. Then they want to, they are interested to say, oh, really, tell me about. So God will make us get to the point of the Christians in Antioch mm -hmm. that people can look at our lives and without a message. Like the Bible says, we are the epistle that many people will read, right? that they will see your lifestyle and be curious to understand why you are the way you are. God will help us. Amen. Hallelujah. I think just to, the last thing we'll probably will talk about to contribute to what Pastor Bola they said is for us to also remember that it is not us that brings people to Christ. It is God. He on his own will bring people. On his own, he will draw them. 
So when you f see that the responsibility is not necessarily on you, then that should take away the fear, the weight. I'm just going to go and talk to Mr. A, and Jesus will, on his own, bring him to himself. Praise the Lord. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us the example of the first Christians. Lord Jesus, help us, fill us with the Holy Ghost, and let our faith show, let our lifestyle draw many to Christ. Let people see us and let them know without us having to do or, you know, even evangelizing, let them know that we are Christians. Overall, Father, we pray that many in this end time will come to know you, that many will come to serve you, many will come to depend on you, and all the glory will be returned to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.